God bless everyone, brothers and sisters in Christ and friends. We are transmitting from Casa de Fe, Yahweh Hire, with pastors Ramon and Diana Crespo, located at 104 Suffolk Street, Holyoke, Massachusetts. You are listening to DJ One Ministries' website is dj1ministry.wibbly.com. God bless David Silva and family at Spring Hill, Florida of Internet's radio join force international.org and Internet TV join force family network. Also transmitting through Salvation TV on Roku player channels are Uniendo Fuerza Internacionalmente and Salvation Online. DJ One TV at YouTube, also of Join Force Family Network. Connect with our ministry at Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and Bamboozer. God bless uh, brothers Junior and Jeannie Soto of Puerto Rico. You will find them through Bandera de Amor.org. Internet's radio. We have our programs, Vere, with Veronica Torres. Mondays, 9 to 10 p.m. Punta de Vista with Lisette Melendez, Wednesday, 8 to 9 p.m. Mujeres de Guerra with the pastor, Diana Crespo, 9 to 10 p.m. It's a joint kind of uh, theme program. Very interesting. And Sobre Alas de Aguila, the Spanish version of On Wings of an Eagle with Rosemary Santiago, Thursdays, 9.30 to 10.30 p.m., and we have Praise Break with DJ One, Fridays, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to go now, enter in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks, Lord, for this opportunity. Thanks for your mercy, Lord. I know you're always with me, Father, especially in my times of trouble. I ask you, Lord, that you give me a clear mind so I can speak what is on your mind and your heart. I ask you these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Our theme, the theme will be forgiveness. I want to start first in uh, Genesis chapter 315. In a lot of the programs, in all these different ministries, they are going to mention this is a very, very important and loving scripture Although it looks a little bit complicated, but we're going to try to make it simplified. We know that, first of all, Adam was given a command, command not to touch, not to eat of the fruit. And he was the first one to receive that command. Then later on, we have in chapter 3, where Satan, disguised in, in the body of a serpent, starts like a conversation with Eve, and he kind of puts God like a liar. The thing is, is that she was attracted to not so much the smell of the fruit, the look of the fruit, how beautiful it was, how 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 scrumptious it looked, but more because it says in verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was Pleasant to the eyes. That's where the problem uh, lies. It was pleasant to her eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. And you have to ask yourself, what eyes are we talking about? Was it literally using her physical eyes? Because over here, we have in, in chapter 2, where the Lord is said to have made things that were appealing to the eyes. Every fruit that was there was beautiful looking, colorful, delicious, and very delightful to look at. So here we see a strategy of Satan to make her fall and transgress. But one thing that's very interesting is even though they had fallen into sin. The Lord was already providing a way out. It's called forgiveness. 
So 315, he's literally stating what his plan is, but he does it in such a way where it's not completely exposed. It's so gracious of God. He is merciful that when we come to the Lord, he opens up our eyes. And once we start reading these things, it's like the Holy Spirit that was sent to be with us, but to be within us because he works from inside out. The fruit that you see in our lives is the exterior proof that he's working on the interior. So he says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, Satan's seed would be those children of disobedience, whereas the seed or the child of the woman, his seed would be children of obedience because we were made in his image and likeness and his intention was to give us the power to become his children. It's very sad to hear of so many cultures with with their gods, gods of destruction, gods that are capricious, gods that are not a father to any of them. They're not really knowing if they're forgiven or not. They don't know until they die. But it's so wonderful so marvelous to know that the Lord, because he said that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, not only is God sending his son and that his son is willing to pay a price. Now, this is something very profound. First of all, we know that there's only one God. When we say one, literally, there is only one God. That's his profession. That's his position. That is not his person. It's just like we have a body. People look at us. They see us externally, but that is not us. The person within us is us. We are spirit. We have a soul. We were made a living soul. In that soul, it's like a case for our emotions, our intellect, our ways of reasoning, our perceptions, even our discernments, which is equivalent to maybe the animal's perception instincts. We have human instincts. When we are in danger, there's a rush. We protect ourselves. We try to think things out. We verbalize things. Okay, what am I going to do? That is the person. The body is not the person. So what happened in the case of, of God, the only God, and to give an image of what it is to be a father a forgiving father, he had to take on a body. That body's name is Jesus Christ. He is the son of God that was a symbol, a model of a human that submits to God, but to a father. Just like you have parents, right? They have children. The children, some children... They submit themselves to their parents. They are obedient. The father and the mother, they are proud. And God in the same. He said that he had delight in his son. Because his son, whatever he did, as a human, he did it for the honor and glory of his father. We're going to see little examples here. Okay, so in Genesis 3.15... God, the Father, 
decides that he's going to cover their sin through this promise, in the future was going to be someone that would save us from ourselves, from our lifestyles, from sin, from the enemy, from the wiles, from his strategy. In verse 21, it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. First, he covers their sin in chapter 315. Now, you see him covering their physical nakedness. And he does one more thing. In the middle of that garden was not only the tree of that science, the knowledge of good and evil, but also was the tree of life. So he did something. He says, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, why is that important? Why is it important for you and I to know that the promise 315 covers the sin? Verse 21st, the covering of the physical nakedness. And now we have on the 24th where he literally puts guards so that they would not go in again into the garden and take from its fruit. Now, we already know that they were eternally damned, but the promise came in. Now, what would have happened if in the state of sin would they have taken from the tree of life? Isn't it logical that if they are in a state of sin and then they eat of the tree of life, they would lose any chance of salvation because this is the tree, the eternal tree, the tree of life. So he covers their sin, covers their physical nakedness. And you know what's so important about it? For him to cover them with making coats of skins, that means that he had to kill an animal. It was the first animal sacrifice to cover them also. It was a foreshadow of what was to come. Now it says here in uh, 17.4, Leviticus 17.4, And bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord. Blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. Then it tells you that the reason why on verse 11, it tells you, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Here's proof that that animal sacrifice, the first animal sacrifice that was done, the purpose was to cover them, not only to put a coat on them, but it was to be the foreshadow of what was to come. Now, in chapter 50, we have the uh, situation of, the brothers of Joseph, who in their hearts, they wanted to, they wanted to sell him. Well, they had other intentions first. Their intentions were, was to get rid of their brother, but the elders and the second elders had a tendency to kind of get into it and, and say, you know, we would gain nothing if we would kill our brother. Let us sell him. And the strange thing is they never even got to sell him. They put him into the uh, the well, the deep well, had no water. God already had a plan. 
already set up. Plan A is always his plan. Whether we do a lot of uh, curves and we, we take here, we take there. God's plan is always A and he always gets to fulfill whatever it is that he has in his heart. So in Genesis chapter 50, verse 17, here his brothers, at the very end where Joseph was going to discover, he was going to reveal to his brothers that um, the second one in government was he himself. He was disguised because they had different types of uh, customs where the Egyptian male used to have uh, the eyes painted and all that kind of stuff. They used to wear also kind of like wigs. So they wouldn't recognize him. But when at the very end, the father had already died, it says in 17, So shall ye say unto Joseph, that was uh, his father Jacob, his words at the time that they were going through all these changes, so you're going to tell Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, of thy brother, and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. His intentions was not to get back just because the father had died. He had a forgiving heart. Forgiveness is a very, very powerful weapon. It releases you from being a slave to passions, to thoughts. Forgiving is a virtue. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I've had in many, many years of my life, I have 41 years in the Lord, and I have had very, very, very bad trials and tribulations, people that I really and truly loved. And then you think about all the things that were done through the Bible, people that were very gracious, very uh, wonderful people. They were uh, treated badly but they knew how to forgive. Here we have um, the word forgive. Forgive is nasa. It means to bear, to endure, to cause one to bear. And though you're bearing a lot of wounds, a lot of uh, anxiety and going through all these changes, but when it says to cause one to bear, we're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about taking and forgiving a debt. They owe you something. They owe you because of the cruelty. But you took it upon yourself. You take that, if it was written in, in black and white, you rip up that paper and you say, I have no more debt with you. Or you have no debt against me. I forgive your debt. Whatever it is, let's make amends. Let's start fresh. Well, that, that's happening a lot within the church, within families, husbands, wives, children, their parents, neighbors. We must learn to forgive. The word trespass, the word pasha, which means rebellion, now, there's a quote that's very important. It has both words. It talks about forgiveness. It talks about uh, transgressions, which is the same word as trespass. We will find it in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, 5. And it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Transgressions, again, rebellion. The word chastisement, musar, it means discipline and correction. Now, now let, let's, let's look at this. 
It says, now he receives the discipline. He received the correction. He was the one that received the wounds. I want you to see what kind of wounds he received. I want you to see here, 56. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Okay, now we're talking about forgiveness. He received the discipline or correction. Huh? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. He receives the discipline and the correction, the bruises. They mark up his face because it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Let's see what happened. 52, 14. It says, as many were astonished, they were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. So he receives a discipline or correction. We receive peace. In other words, our peace was obtained by him paying the price for what we committed. Because in him there was no sin. And this was pre-planned by his father. Let's see what it says in um, 53, 10, and 11. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. What do you think of a father like that? What do you think of a Lord, a God, who from the very beginning... Man had already decided that they were going to make their way. They were going to do it their way. They were going to overlook what was said to them. They were going to choose to be disobedient, which if you look at it, it would have classified them as the seed of Satan, children of disobedience. But the Lord automatically covered their sins with the promise of a savior, covers their physical nakedness, but he also covered a foreshadow sacrifice of his son. And the only one that could please and satisfy, because if we read this, we might interpret it the wrong way. What are we saying? That he was a, a sadist? That it was pleased to bruise him, to hurt him. It was pleasing for him to travail of his soul. Because the only thing that pleased him is that the only one that could pay the price and save us from our own sins and from the bondage of Satan was his son, Jesus Christ. It was a pre planned thing here we have an Isaiah chapter 6 which is a symbol because it's the question that is asked it says chapter 6 verse 8 also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us then said I, here am I, send me. This was a prophetic wording. It was the pre-planned, the promise of God, the only God 
the one that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it would please him, please him that he gave himself as a sin sacrifice, knowing that the only way that this could be done is God taking form of a man. A lot of people question the deity. We understand that there is only one God. That should not be so hard to understand. One God. There's one God and only one mediator between God and man. That's the man Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now it says here in Colossians. Because he would have to take upon himself a body because no one can see his spirit. If I was walking down the street like this, well, you would recognize me. You would say, oh, that's Rosemary Santiago. But should I be out of my body? I don't think you can see me, right? Look what it says in chapter 1, verse 15. It says, okay, let me go a little bit before that. 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are, are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross there we go again he paid for our iniquities by paying the price by dying and being accused of something that he never committed but he took our place and we got the peace and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So it says he receives a discipline or correction. We receive peace. In other words, our peace was obtained by him paying the price for what we committed. That was sin, our sinful nature. What was the purpose behind this sacrifice? Let's look at what's at 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, 19 through 21. It says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Now mind you, what does it mean that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself? Because God himself took upon himself a body and came as Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't understand why it's so hard for people to understand this. Because if you say God, he has to be all-knowing, almighty, all-powerful. Because he is God. He has those attributes. Why is it so hard to understand that one God can take upon himself to make a body named Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. And then Jesus Christ say, uh, 
We're going to send you another consoler, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You have a spirit. I have a spirit. Why should it be so hard to understand that an almighty God can do these things? This is mere bag of shells for him. This is so simple. It's hard for you and I because we are finite. We have finite minds. We think with a very thin mind. The word supernatural, we're on the natural realm and he's on the super. He's above all things. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses, their rebellion unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What is that word reconciliation? What does it mean? Okay, if we go to the very beginning, Adam and Eve used to walk and talk through the garden with the father. That was their relationship. They were able to see him. They had their spiritual eyes working in their favor until they decided to disobey and that was cut off. That's a privilege that only you and I can have in the spirit world when we seek his presence, when we desire only to do his will. It's not easy. I know I have to battle every single time, especially with these things that are going through my body and it affects my mind, but I have a responsibility. My responsibility is to do his will. And I have to believe that whatever it is that he promises, he's faithful and true to fulfill it. So now we have a God who reconciles unto himself. And he doesn't uh, uh, impute our rebellion for he hath made him to be sin for us. He made Jesus Christ to be sin for us. Does that sound like a, a vicious God? Because I know when things go wrong, everybody just, you know, nobody wants to. Oh, you know, the, the, the old time excuse. Uh, Adam said, oh, the woman that you gave me. And Eve said, the, the serpent... Uh, deceived me and when it was the time for for maybe the the serpent to say something the literal reptile serpent i'm sure he turned around and he says whoa wait a minute i have nobody that i can blame he was cursed for being used and you know what's wrong with humans we always make excuses it's easy to point our finger to someone else but boy, is it so hard for us to admit, because we are so prideful, admit that it's our fault or part of our fault, and we both did this wrong. But nobody wants to give in. It looks like an arm wrestling match. Who's going to come down first? Let me make you come down first. So God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not in, in putting their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How, how amazing that is. Now, we always talk about the Lord's sacrifice. But was that the only time that he did a sacrifice or, you know, because I mean, you and I, we, we are uh, human beings. We get tempted. We go through changes. We come so close to giving in. We get tempted. But let's see what it says in Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15. Because we hear a lot of people say, oh, but he does not know what I am going through how does he know he is God? I am a human. Let's see if that's true. 4.15 says, 
For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And mind you, he didn't do it as a God, as a God. That would have been easy for him to do anything as a God. He came down in a body to experiment everything that you and I are going through. One way or another. First John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, not talking about the, the male, talking about the human, man, human. That's where the word Adam comes from. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is something that was said way after he had died. But let's put the Lord Jesus Christ being tempted in the desert. Let's see what happens. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, 1 to 10. So that you understand that as a man, as a human, he was tempted just like anybody else. You can't tempt a God. That sounds ridiculous. We spoke of in John, 1 John two fifteen, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Now we're going into Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to read from 1 to 10. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God... Command that these stones be made bread. Okay, so you have the first first quality of the world, lust of the flesh. He's telling him, okay, I know you're hungry. You've been fasting for a lot. It's so easy. You're the son of God. Command that these stones be made of bread. Lust of the flesh. But he answered and said, it is written. And we have to remember when we're going through these things, we are going to be bombarded every day from now until the rapture, the very rapture that a lot of people still don't believe in. But that's besides the point. We're going to be bombarded to see if we are going to weaken in such a way that we are going to do what everybody else does, give their back to God and lose out. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, now that word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God is our daily bread. Not like a lot of people think that in the Our Father. And give us this day our daily bread. We always have daily bread. We have food in our homes. Little bit, a lot more. We always have something before we go to bed. In a lot of other places, maybe they are not that blessed. And it's nice if you have money, if you would give that offering, right? But we're talking about forgiveness. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Give me a break. The Lord Jesus Christ is in the desert. You know that there is no temple in the desert. So where in the world is that battle going on? For every one of us, our minds, we are being bombarded in our minds. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, 
lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. You know, he's got a capacity of taking part of the word of God and he'll flash it back in the head, making you think that this is, this is what God is really saying. Now, which side of, of the three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now he could have said, yes, I am the son of God. I definitely am the son of God. And you know something? I am also come to do these things, but you know, I can do this. I know the angels would, would, would protect me because I am his son, but that's not what he came for. He came to do a job. If he would have been led by pride of life, he is life. He is the son of God. He didn't have to really prove it. Satan knew it. But what would have happened if he would have been very quick to, to do something like this? He was actually asking him to commit suicide. Because if he would have done anything out of the will of God, Anything that's out of the will of God is called sin. Then he would have sinned and Satan would have had right over him. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And mind you, he was not even talking about himself. He was talking about don't tempt the father. Don't fool around with this. Don't fool around with the words. Don't fool around with the scripture inspired by my father's Holy Spirit. When he was 12 years old, he knew that he had to have been in, in his father's business. But he wasn't talking as part of that Godhead. He was talking as a child that understood that he had to be obedient to the law of God. Just like you and I, we have to be obedient to the law of God. So it was the pride of life that he was attacking him. Now it says again, that's the third time, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, all these things will I give thee. If thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. But what was he showing him? The kingdoms, all the glories. And that's the lust of the eyes. All these things will I give thee. And for all those who are listening, everything has a price. Even in the good things of the Lord, in the perfect things of the Lord, there is sacrifice. You have to give something in return. The Lord Jesus Christ did the, the, the biggest of all. He died for our sins. He, we were forgiven. We were restored. But you know, the Lord said, to his disciples, whoever wants to follow me must deny thyself. They must carry their cross every day and follow me. That's a price you have to pay. So when Satan starts offering these things out of nowhere, money and women or men and, and all these material stuff, what is his price? What do you have to pay? Because once you give in, and you sell your soul, he will have you as a slave. You will be shackled. He darkens the mind. You end up doing things you would never have imagined. Like a lot of these people that go into this uh, Illuminati kind of pact, and uh, they either have to live a... Uh, a perverted life with their kids. They have sex with their own kids. Uh, just to make it in the movies. To make it uh, as a singer. The, the women exploit themselves. You know. And they are owned. You know. Whoever seeks the kingdom of God. Is not owned. 
It is your pleasure to serve. I always show the difference between slave and a servant. A servant or a butler. It's in the same level. They go, they find a job, they like cooking, they do all these kind of uh, domestic things. They get paid for it. What slave is paid? What slave uh, decides the hours that they are going to put in? This is something to really think about. We're talking about forgiveness. God forgives, right? Okay. In the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, Matthew 26. I'll try to go as quickly as possible. Okay. 39 to 40. 26. 39 to 40. It says, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Wilt. This is him struggling. When you are being tempted, you could be tempted in so many different ways. He went into watchful prayer for an hour. Look at what uh, Luke 22, 42. Luke 22, 42 to 46. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That happens after the hour of prayer. He's starting to come down a bit. There's a difference. There's a change in his prayer. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were Great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he asked, why sleep ye? Rise and pray lest ye enter in temptation. We must pray. Then we have again Matthew 26, 43 to 46, where it says, and he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Do you know that an angel comforted him to be able to withstand that temptation? He could have given in, but then he would say, let it not be my will, but yours. Let me see what uh, Jeremiah 31 and 33 and 34 verses. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. But I want to leave you with one that's very important. A lot of people overlook this. You know, when it comes to forgiveness, this here is conditional. This forgiving uh, our sins is conditional. And, and sometimes it's, it's a little scary because people are constantly saying, no, I won't forgive. No, because of what they did, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. But let me tell you what the Word of God says. And it's the famous Our Father. And it's in chapter 6, 12 of Matthew. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A debt could be money, but a debt could be something that has been done against you, that has wounded your emotions. So let me let you understand that if you do not forgive... You will not be forgiven. I want to lead you into prayer. All those who, who want to be forgiven. 
Now take this seriously. It's so simple. All you have to do is repeat these words. You're going to feel the presence of God leading you. God, I have sinned against you. I ask forgiveness. I have done many things, but I ask that that sin sacrifice, that blood cleanse me of my sins, that your Holy Spirit may guide me, that I may do your will, and that you write my name in the book of life. I ask you these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I praise you, Lord. I ask for cleansing, Father, for their lives, that you may heal them spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, and socially. Nothing, Lord, nothing uh, left out where it comes to their needs, Father. I ask you these things in Jesus' mighty name. This has been uh, Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. I invite you to look for a church that preaches the truth from Genesis to Revelation. God bless you.